Thank you for the invitation to speak here today. I'm excited to touch on the topic of congestive heart failure in women. And I'm excited because I think some of the most profound sex differences that we see in cardiovascular medicine are manifest in our patients with congestive heart failure. We see this every day in clinical practice. You've also heard from previous speakers today already about potential side effects of pregnancy, um, breast cancer therapies, microvascular dysfunction, all things that really predispose women in particular um, to the eventual development of heart failure. And so I really like to frame this talk around the ACC AHA heart failure stages um, and really highlight differences between women and men that start at the very origins of stage A heart failure, the presence of risk factors. Uh, differences that remain pervasive as patients progress to stage B or asymptomatic structural heart disease and onto clinically overt symptomatic stage C heart failure and ultimately end stage heart failure or stage D. What I hope to illustrate is that the sex differences are incredibly pervasive throughout the entire disease course of heart failure. So to set the stage, we know that the lifetime risk of heart failure is similar in men and women. One in five people across the globe will develop heart failure at some point in their lives. Uh, we also know that the prevalence is similar among men and women. Overall, women with heart failure tend to have slightly better clinical outcomes. On the right, you can see data from the Optimize HF registry, which was a US-based registry of over 26,000 individuals. And you can see that women at one year had a slightly lower mortality rate with a hazard ratio of 0.93. And these estimates have really been uh, replicated globally um, across other international studies. Recall that when we look at overall heart failure, it's important to look at subtypes. We know about half of patients with overall heart failure have preserved rather than reduced ejection fraction heart failure. And I think it's when we consider these heart failure subtypes where sex differences really become quite apparent. And so for example, um, in a study of patients from the Framingham Heart Study um, and the hospital-based effect registry, we found that at first heart failure presentation, walking in the door of the hospital, women have a nearly threefold higher odds of having HEF-PEF compared with men. This is mirrored by data from the ADHERE registry where women outnumber men two to one in the number of HEF-PEF hospitalizations. This is uh, showing similar data, um, again, a different way from the Euro heart failure survey. You can see they plotted um, LV ejection fraction across the x-axis. Um, and you can see that uh, for um, all comers with heart failure, men plotted in the dark gray had on average a lower ejection fraction compared with women plotted in the light gray. And in fact, more than half of men had an LVEF grade at less than 40%, whereas only a third of women had uh, ejection fractions that qualified them um, as HEF-REF. Now, um, we know that uh, men have a greater incidence of HEF-REF, and by contrast, women have a greater prevalence of HEF-PEF, it's also important to recognize that for HEF-PEF, uh, there exists no current medical therapies that have been shown to benefit patients with respect to clinical outcomes. And so I would say that in particular for our women with heart failure, there's a greater therapeutic gap where we don't know how to treat the majority of women with heart failure. Um, now, these differences in heart failure make you wonder whether risk factor profiles in women are very different compared with men. Um, and the answer is they are. Um, so I've summarized clinical features of women and men at their first heart failure presentation across multiple cohorts. Women with heart failure on average were older, um, had more hypertension, but less ischemic heart disease. Women and men had similar rates of diabetes as well as obesity. Now beyond the imbalances and comorbidities we just reviewed, there are really interesting differential responses to a given risk factor. Um, that are worth going into. These are data showing the hazard ratio for heart failure um, that is sex stratified for women and men um, in the middle column. Um, next to it, you can see the prevalence of a given risk factor. Um, and on the most right-hand column, you can see the population attributable risk. This tells you essentially the proportion of heart failure cases that could theoretically be eliminated if you could adequately address a given risk factor. And so you can see here, for example, that hypertension portends a more than threefold increased hazard for future heart failure among women compared with only a twofold hazard among men. When we take into account the high prevalence, 
we end up with a population attributable risk um, for hypertension of 59% in women and only 39% in men. We see similar uh, signals for diabetes, where diabetes has a nearly fourfold increased hazard for future heart failure among women compared with a less than twofold hazard in men. When we take into account prevalence, we again end up with a population attributable risk that is double um, that in women compared with men for diabetes in relation to heart failure development. And then we see the converse for myocardial infarction. MI, it turns out, confers a similar hazard among women and men for future risk of heart failure. And yet, because it's more prevalent in, in men, we see a population attributable risk in men that is 34% compared with only 13% in women. Now, why do we see these disparate findings of cardiovascular risk factors and heart failure risk? Well, it turns out that the type of LB remodeling we see, for example, in states of pressure overload is different in men compared with women. For example, among individuals with hypertension, women have a much greater odds of having concentric LVH without chamber enlargement compared with men that tend to have more eccentric hypertrophy. We see similar findings in aortic stenosis in another pressure overload state. These are data from an, uh, an older um, aortic stenosis valvuloplasty registry. And you can see that for the same level of valve area um, ascertained by cardiac catheterization, women had a higher relative wall thickness um, and greater prevalence of LVH. 80% of women here in this study had LVH compared with only 50% of men at the same given valve area. These findings are actually recapitulated in animal studies of aortic banding where male rats show an early transition to heart failure, heart failure with LV dilation and elevated wall stress. By contrast, female rats have greater prevalence of uh, or greater development of concentric LVH and preserved contractile function. The sex differences in LV remodeling are not just unique to states of pressure overload. We also see this in diabetes and aging. Uh, these are beautiful data um, uh, worked on by Wolfgang Lieb in the Framingham Heart Study, um, tracking really the uh, course of LV mass over about 16 years spanning adult life you can see that women have a greater and steeper increase in LV mass with increasing age. He also found that increases in LV mass were particularly steep among women with diabetes, uh, where um, uh, increases were nearly threefold um, higher than in women without diabetes and certainly higher than in men. Concomitant with this increase in concentric LVH with aging and diabetes, we also see increases in LV stiffness. Um, these are data from Olmsted County of patients or participants who underwent echocardiography separated by about four years. And you can see that over time, both men and women develop increases in LV and systolic and end diastolic elastins. And yet women had much greater increases in end diastolic elastins compared with men, whereas end systolic elastins was similar. Lastly, we recently also showed that obesity seems to have a differential e effect in heart failure development among women compared with men. Uh, this was a study where we were able to pool longitudinal community, community based cohorts across four large studies um, and studied over 22,000 individuals. You can see that obese women shown in the solid red uh, cumulative incidence plots here had really by far and away the highest risk of future development of PEF PEF even compared with obese men shown in the solid blue lines and non-obese counterparts shown in the, in the dashed lines. These data are uh, uh, really aligned with data from the Women's Health Initiative on, on the right, showing that after hypertension, the greatest population attributable risk uh, for HEFPEF in women is that of obesity. Now, the mechanism by which risk factors, including hypertension, obesity, and diabetes, portend worse heart failure risk among women compared with men is not clear. We do know that the heightened responses to cardiometabolic dysfunction in women underlie some of the sex differences in heart failure subtypes we observe. We can understand this within this, uh, the context of this framework put forth by Walter Paulus, where we really envision disease pathogenesis for HEF-REF shown on the right and HEF-PEF on the left as fundamentally distinct. We know that HEF-REF um, is a primary state of myocyte loss, which triggers a secondary cardiovascular remodeling. And by contrast, in states of HEF-PEF, uh, 
we have uh, comorbid conditions that induce a systemic inflammatory response, secondary changes in endothelial cell inflammation and subsequent um, effects on uh, cardiomyocytes, uh, including downregulation of cyclic GMP. And so the higher risk for HEF-REF in men has been attributed to a greater predisposition to macrovascular coronary artery disease. And by contrast, endothelial inflammation and coronary microvascular dysfunction in women are thought to underlie HEF-PEF as well as some of the other heart failure syn syndromes that women are predisposed to, including Takotsubo cardiomyopathy as well as pericardium cardiomyopathy. In addition to coronary microvascular dysfunction, Many other um, mechanisms may be at play. Animal models of pressure overload showed wi show widespread sex differences in induction of uh, cardiac nitric oxide synthase, fetal gene programs, and circa 2 Differences are also seen at the cellular and architectural level. Um, I show here data from a uh, post-transplant study um, where um, investigators examined explanted hearts and showed that myocyte apoptosis and necrosis were more than twofold higher in men that they studied compared with women. In addition to differences in cardiac remodeling, uh, we also know that extra cardiac uh, uh, factors play a huge role. We know that women in general have worse arterial stiffness compared with men, which predisposes them to age-associated ventricular arterial uncoupling as a setup to heart failure. In light of these very different responses in LV adaptation to pressure overload, the natural question is what sex hormones, what role sex hormones might play and specifically what estrogen might play in cardiovascular remodeling across the life cycle. It turns out that estrogen receptors are expressed in cardiomyocytes and fibroblasts. Um, we know in one study of about 850 women that genetic polymorphisms in the ESR1 gene, the estrogen receptor, um, that is thought to mediate effects on the myocardium were associated with longitudinal changes in LV mass and LV wall thickness. And in experimental models um, of pressure overload, replacement with 17 beta estradiol is thought to abrogate some of the pressure overload responses. You can see, for example, in this animal model, um, after a transverse aortic constriction, um, there is a, a great response with respect to LVH that then is attenuated with administration of estradiol. Now, is estrogen the whole story? We know that sex hormones have indirect effects on the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. We also know androgen, um, androgens uh, directly affect natriuretic peptides, which we think play a huge role in terms of pathophysiology of heart failure. But there are certainly many, many other factors at play that we don't understand. To put this in context, this was a study we did within the Framingham Heart Study where we examined 71 cardiovascular proteins across men and women. And you can see of the 71 proteins, 86% of them differed significantly by sex. Um, this was really telling with respect to how different uh, men and women really are with respect to cardiovascular disease. When we simply interrogated biomarkers that were upregulated in women, we saw um, enhanced evidence of pathways of inflammation as well as adiposity. And when we similarly looked at pathways that were overrepresented in men or overexpressed in men, we found that these were biomarkers of fibrosis as well as platelet function. And so I think much uh, to learn here still about mechanisms of disease and differences that underlie um, heart failure pathogenesis in men versus women. Now, we've touched on differences in heart failure risk factors and the type of cardiac remodeling that we typically see in women. We're now gonna turn to clinically overt heart failure and specifically talk first about um, differences we see clinically in HEF-REF patients and second in HEF-PEF patients. So I'll take a step back here and say that women in general are underrepresented in HEF-REF trials. This was an interesting post-hoc analysis of two such large HEF-REF trials, Paradigm HF, which looked at Secubitril Valsartan um, in patients with HEF-REF, and Atmosphere, which studied um, Aliskirin, which is a direct renin inhibitor among patients with HEF-REF. In this cohort, women represented just above 20% of patients studied, intended to be older, more obese, had uh, more uh, 
non-ischemic cardiomyopathy as their cause of heart failure or CKD and hypertension compared with their uh, ma male counterparts. What I thought was really interesting is that women across the board tended to have worse quality of life as uh, ascertained by the Kansas City Cardiomyopathy Questionnaire. And along with that and supporting that, also worse clinical features of congestion across the board. You can see here um, a bar diagram with women in blue and you can see women have worse dyspnea, orthopnea, PND, as well as pedal edema compared with men. Now, um, paradoxically, despite more evidence of congestion and clinical features, women had better clinical outcomes as show in, shown in this cumulative incidence plot where the primary outcome is cardiovascular death or first heart failure hospitalization. And then lastly, this study found that women were less likely to receive diuretics, anticoagulation, or device therapies when indicated. What about responses to HEFREF therapies? Again, it's important to keep in mind that women are in general underrepresented in HEFREF trials, and that analysis of sex-specific responses have been rarely specified until recently. It's also important to remember that pharmacokinetics may be very different in women compared with men. One study showed that the maximum plasma concentrations of neurohormonal blocking agents like ACE inhibitors and beta blockers can be over twofold higher in women compared with men after administration of the same dose. Having said that, in general, Sex-specific outcomes for the use of neurohormonal blockade, including ACE inhibitors, ARBs, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and beta blockers, seem similar, with a couple of exceptions that I'll note. Uh, one is that a retrospective study of the DIGE trial does show greater toxicity in women with digoxin. Here you see serum digoxin concentrations across the um, x-axis um, and hazard ratio for all-cause mortality across the y-axis. Women are represented in the black uh, squares and men in the open squares. And you can see that for a given level of serum digoxin concentration, women had a greater hazard of uh, death with, um, with ditch toxicity. By contrast, this is a uh, subgroup analysis of the made it CRT trial. And you can see that women who were randomized to ICD shown in purple um, and CRTD shown in blue had a much greater reduction in death or heart failure and all-cause mortality compared with their male counterparts. Um, and interestingly, in made it CRT, this um, signal for benefit was also corroborated by greater reverse remodeling on echocardiography in women. Now, while the use of neurohormonal blockade is beneficial across both sexes, it turns out that optimal doses may be different. This was a recently published study in Lancet from Biostat CHF. Uh, this is a prospective study that was done across 11 European countries. It aimed to enroll patients with HEFREF that were not on target doses of guideline-directed medical therapy. And the goal of this study was to titrate patients to target doses. And the authors did a really interesting analysis. Um, I'll walk you through it here. So, they looked at the relative risk of mortality or heart failure hospitalization across the y-axis across the range of target dose of a given neurohormonal blocking agent across the x-axis, ranging from zero to 100% of the target dose. Um, and they found some really interesting differences. So I've just pulled the graph for ACE inhibitors here. You can see that um, men had the lowest hazard of the primary endpoint at 100% of the target dose of ACE inhibition. By contrast, women had the lowest hazard at about less than 50% of the recommended dose without further benefit as you increase that dose to the target. There were similar findings uh, for beta blockers, um, again, where uh, men really had a continual decrease in hazard as you titrate up their dose compared with women that tended to have more U-shaped or a J-shaped hazard with the lowest risk of around about 50% uh, percent of the dose of the recommended dose without further benefit uh, with further up titration. What I take away from this and other studies in HEFREF is that we need to be more vigilant in starting GDMT and considering devices in our women with HEFREF. And yet, I think this study really brings into question 
uh, what the true optimal dose of neurohormonal blockade agents are in women. This remains unclear and I think impresses upon us the importance for us to remain vigilant about potential side effects in our women uh, with heart failure as we titrate GDMT. Now, lastly, uh, when it comes to our HEFREF patients with advanced therapies, we see parallel sex differences. This is an analysis of over 13,000 individuals in the United Network for Organ Sharing, or UNOS database, who were listed for heart transplantation. At the time of listing, we can see that women were less likely to have durable LVAD as a bridge to transplant strategy. And further, once listed, women experienced higher waitlist mortality um, and lower chances of ultimately going to heart transplantation. It's unclear why these disparities exist. Part of it may be that women uh, get referred later in the disease process with underutilization of GDMT. Uh, we also know that transplant specific considerations may be at play, including greater alloimmunity or sensitization in women compared with men. Now, in the last few minutes, we're gonna turn to HEFPEF. We already touched on the fact that cardiac remodeling in women is marked, marked by greater concentric LVH and LV stiffness. These differences get even more exaggerated once HEFPEF develops. For example, in Paramount, we know that more than a third of women with HEFPEF had concentric remodeling or hypertrophy compared to less than a quarter of men. We also know in careful PV loop studies that women have impaired diastolic function and higher LV diastolic and systolic stiffening. And lastly, uh, we recently examined women compared with men with HEFPEF, um, and it turns out that women have distinct deficits that really contribute to exercise intolerance, um, including multiple deficits uh, with worse biventricular systolic reserve, diastolic reserve, as well as the inability to peripherally extract oxygen. And so I think these are all potential contributors to some of the sex differences we see in patients with HEFPEF. Now, considering that every single HEFPEF trial to date has been neutral or negative, these data from the Paragon HF are, uh, study are really, really fascinating. So recall that Paragon HF is one of the largest HEFPEF studies done to date. It randomized over 4,000 individuals with HEFPEF to uh, Secubitril Valsartan versus Valsartan. The overall trial was, was neutral with a P of 0.06, and yet um, on, uh, analysis, on sex specific analyses, we see a greater treatment effect in women compared with men. This is really of unclear etiology. Um, although in some unpublished data from TopCat and putting together some of these other trials, the investigators in this study hypothesized the sex by treatment modification may really only be apparent at higher LV ejection fractions rather than lower LV ejection fractions seen in HEFREF. Lastly, what do guidelines say about women in heart failure? Um, despite all of these sex differences in treatment response, I would have to say that not, uh, not much is out there in the guidelines. The HFSA 2010 guidelines did address women as a separate section, um, but essentially recommended similar neurohormonal blockade and approaches to GDMT. And uh, newer guidelines, including the ACCHA HFSA updates in 2017, as well as ESC in 2016, had no specific recommendations in women. If you're interested in reading on this topic a little bit more, I can recommend um, a HFSA white paper that was published in 2015 with a focus on special populations, including women and other um, populations that are underrepresented in heart failure trials. And so in sum, I hope I've shown you that sex differences really are pervasive throughout the course of heart failure. Uh, with stage A or the presence of risk factors, we see the same lifetime risk of heart failure, but greater population attributable risk for cardiometabolic disease. In stage B um, heart failure, we see worse concentric LVH, higher LVEF, and worse arterial stiffness, as well as heightened inflammation and microvascular dysfunction among women. In our stage C patients, we see that women um, have a more prevalent HEFPEF, um, worse quality of life, and despite that, uh, generally better clinical outcomes, um, and that there are some differential treatment responses, especially with digoxin, CRT, and most recently, um, Secubitril Valsartan and HEFPEF. And in our stage D or refractory heart failure patients, we see less MCS use and lower chances of cardiac transplantation. We recognize that there are large knowledge, knowledge gaps that still uh, persist with respect to sex-specific mechanisms that lead to heart failure, 
uh, optimal drug doses and therapies for patients uh, or women with heart failure and sex specific criteria for uh, device therapy. And so I think much remains to be learned in this field. Um, with that, I'll close and thank you for your attention.